the civil rights movement, America, the 1950s. For this episode, we'll look at the entire civil rights movement in America, starting from the 1800s. This episode, we'll see how national heroes such as Martin Luther King and Rosa Parks rise up and incite change among racist feuds during the 1950s. We'll also have a look at how groups did not like the idea of the civil rights movement, and therefore took arms to prove a point. That and more for this episode of Summed Up History. Before we talk about the civil rights movement itself, we need to have some backstory. When the European colonists came to the Americas just after the Middle Ages, they tried using the Native Americans as slaves to cultivate the land as it was a good place to grow crops such as cotton, sugar and much more. The problem with that though is that there were not enough natives to enslave. Most had been killed by disease that had been transmitted by the colonists. In order to combat this, the colonists decided to ship Africans off to the Americas to be the slaves in a system called the Atlantic Slave Trade. The colonists offer manufactured goods such as guns to the African kingdoms in exchange for the soon-to-be slaves. Most of these soon-to-be slaves were criminals who would be sent to the Americas just as their, pun as their punishment. The colonists justified this by making claims that Africans were a lesser people compared to the Europeans, using their black skin colour as proof. Before colonialism, these beliefs did not really exist at all, but in our modern day, this type of belief is known as racism. After a couple of centuries or so, the 13 British American colonies gained their independence in a revolutionary war becoming the United States of America. Over the next century, they gained more territory out west, buying and taking more British, French, Mexican and Spanish territory. Some of the new land was used for slavery. Whilst Europe had banned slavery in 1807, the US kept it. The southern US states were most suited for agriculture, so they were the states who mostly had slavery, whilst the north was increasingly industrialising. Tensions grew as people in the north worried that their land may be taken away to expand to slavery, whilst in the south, slave owners worried that the north were going to ban slavery, something that they had grown economically dependent on. Despite compromises kicking the can down the road, civil war broke out in 1861. Despite the Union winning the war and banning slavery, not much changed in the south. Most former slaves stayed as slaves, with the only difference being that they would get paid a small wage to make it legal. Banning slavery was never a moral issue for white people, but an economic one. With slavery being common in the South, that is where most of the racism in the US came from. With all that out of the way, we move on to the 1900s. The main thing that the civil rights movement was trying to combat was segregation, a system that separated people based on race, in this case. Things like segregated fountains, segregated waiting rooms, segregated schools, segregated restaurants and many more rules were made to prevent black people from gaining too much power. These rules were collectively known as the Jim Crow laws. Starting off with segregated schools, the conditions of white schools were typically better than the black schools. They had better teachers, more space, and not too many students, whilst the black schools had broken windows, cracked walls, and too many students. For a famous court case that went against segregated schools was the Brown vs Board of Education case. Linda Brown was a black student who lived in Topeka, Kansas in 1954. 
because she was black student, she had to go to a black school. Said black school being two miles from her home, despite the fact that there was a white school closer to her home. Her father, Oliver Brown, was so outraged about this to the point where, with the help of the National Association for the Advancement of Coloured People, or the NAACP, took to the, the Topeka BOE to court. On, on May 19th, 1954, the court ruled school segregation to be unconstitutional. Judicially, this was a step to more equality for black people, but in actuality, the southern states did what they always did and ignored it. By 1956, there was still not a single mixed school in six southern states, making many historians doubt the importance of this court case. The social situation of schools in the south changed the next year, however, with the city of Little Rock, Arkansas being at the centre stage. There were these nine black students who, with the help of good grades, managed to enrol into the mostly white Little Rock High School. These nine students were nicknamed the Little Rock Nine. It was not all sunshines and rainbows though, as throughout the school year they were met with abuse and death threats from the white students. Minnie Jean Brown was expelled from the school for fighting back against the abuse. On the first day of the school year, Elizabeth Eckford got lost trying to find the entrance to the school and was surrounded by a racist mob, suffering abuse and chants such as, quote, lynch her, lynch her, end quote. The National Guard were called in to keep the peace, but they actually just protected the status quo in the South, blocking the Little Rock Nine from entering the school. The then US President Dwight Eisenhower called on the US Army to keep the peace instead and allow the students a safe entry into the school. This event gained the attention of the Southern press, filling the newspapers with racist headlines. It would end well though with Ernest Green becoming the first black student to graduate from Little Rock High, encouraging more integration of school students that is still a work in progress to this day. The next event we're going to talk about really highlights the race differences in the North and South at the time, this being the murder of Emmett Till. Emmett was a 14 year old black boy raised in Chicago, Illinois. As he lived in the North, racism was not that strong with groups like the Ku Klux Klan, also known as the KKK, not being a strong influence. People of different races got along alright in Chicago. Emmett was sent to stay with his uncle Moses, who lived in a small segregated southern town in Mississippi. Before Emmett went, his mother warned him that life in the south was much different from the north. In Mississippi, he had made friends with a group of black boys who went with him to a local grocery school called Bryant's. Emmett had bragged to all his friends that in the north he could talk to any white girl and he would not be in trouble. The boys did not believe him, so they dared him to flirt with Caroline Bryant, who is a wife of the store owner. Eyewitnesses' views are mixed in saying what he did. Some say he wolf whistled at her. Others say he said the words, quote, by baby, end quote. Whilst Caroline herself claimed that he groped her and asked her out on a date, although this may have been racially driven. Whatever he actually did, Caroline told as many people what she claimed he did to her, including her own husband, who, alongside his half-brother Millen, kidnapped, killed, and drowned Emmett. The details were truly gruesome. He was bitten, had an eye gouged out, shot in the head, tied to barbed wire, and a 70 pound weight and thrown into the Tallahatchie River. When his body was found three days later, his mother only managed to identify him by a ring he was wearing on his finger. She decided to have an open casket funeral so that the press could take a look at what the two men had done to Emmett. The pictures that were published moved black people all across the country, with preachers to magazines saying that something should be done to stop this. Many eyewitnesses had testified against the two men. The white jury and judge ruled that two men were not guilty. Despite this murder being one of many in the southern states, it made people from both north and south realise that this was a big issue and that they had to fight for the civil rights.
Moving on to bus segregation. In the south, black people always had to sit at the back of the buses and give up their seat to white people if there were not any left. Rosa Parks was a black woman who lived in Alabama in the south where segregation was a factor of life. It was not until she was seven years old when she realized that black people and white people were off always segregated from waiting rooms to buses to restrooms and more. From then on, despite thinking that it was wrong, she knew she could not really do anything about it. That was until December 1st, 1955. She was on a bus on her way home from work when a white person came onto the bus and expected Rosa to give up her seat, but Rosa did not move. The bus driver asked Rosa to give her up her seat, but Rosa kept seated. Police officers also asked her to give up her seat, but she still stayed still. About the third stop from where I boarded the bus, there, there were some white people got on and they took all the front seats and left one man standing. And when the driver saw this man standing up. White man. Yes, he was white. Mm -hmm. He didn't, the, the passenger didn't ask for the seat at all. or didn't say anything, but just found a place to stand. The driver noticed him standing and that is when he told the four of us to let him have those seats, which meant the four of us would have been standing and then this man would, could only occupy one seat and then there would be three vacant seats. Because you weren't supposed to sit next to a white man. That was, that was the rule then. So you did not get up? No, I did Do you didn't. know why? Yes, because why? I didn't think I should have to get up. I had already paid my fare, and I'm sure he didn't pay any more than I did. And I didn't think that once we take a seat, even in uh, under segregation uh, conditions, that we should be made to stand up in, in a crowded bus. The officers had no choice but to arrest her for civil disobedience. Despite the NAACP supporting their case, Rosa was fined a total of $14, which is $140 in today's money. In protest to this, an activist by the name of Martin Luther King Jr. organised the Montgomery Bus Boycott, where throughout the city of Montgomery, black people stopped taking the buses off as a mode of transport, instead walking to work and making a system of sharing cars. It is estimated that 40,000 people took part in the bus boycott on the first day. The boycott continued for another year until the Supreme Court ruled that bus segregation was unconstitutional in order to stop losing money. Instead, opting for the first come first seated policy, highlighting that if people are united over a cause, change may happen. Now on to restaurant segregation. In the South, black people and white people had to be seated on segregated tables in restaurants with white people getting served first. Four college freshmen, known as the Greensboro Four, were inspired by Martin Luther King Jr. and other activists, so they decided that they could make some change themselves. They entered the Woolwich department store and sat in the white-only seats of the lunch counter. Despite re being refused service and asked to leave, they stayed even beyond closing hours. Over the next few weeks, more people joined the sitting, spreading to other restaurants and other southern states such as Atlanta and Nashville. Despite many arrests, there were too many people taking part to be able to arrest all of them. The effects were not all good, as in some cases it made people even more racist, with groups like the KKK getting involved by attacking and even killing some protesters. Regardless of this, the Greensboro Citizen made national headlines, pressuring restaurants to get rid of restaurant segregation, highlighting that if mob mentality is used for good purposes, good things can happen. Finally, on to Martin Luther King Jr. himself. As mentioned before, he was an activist for the civil rights movement, arguably being the most influential figure in the whole movement. 
One event he is famous for is the March on Washington, where 250,000 people protested in the capital city against civil rights abuses and employment discrimination. This was also the event where he made his famous I Have a Dream speech that got 1 million views. So even though we face the difficulties of today and tomorrow, I still have a dream. It is a dream deeply rooted in the American dream. I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. I have a dream that one day on the red hills of Georgia, the sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners will be able to sit down together at the table of brotherhood. I have a dream that one day even the state of Mississippi, a state sweltering with the heat of injustice, sweltering with the heat of oppression will be transformed into an oasis of freedom and justice. I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin but by the content of their character. I have a dream today. I have a dream that one day down in Alabama with its vicious racist, with its governor having his lips dripping with the words of interposition and nullification, one day right there in Alabama little black boys and black girls will be able to join hands with little white boys and white girls as sisters and brothers. I have a dream today. I have a dream that one day every valley shall be exalted. And every hill and mountain shall be made low. The rough places will be made plain. And the crooked places will be made straight. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed. And all flesh shall see it together. This is our hope. This is a faith that I go back to the south with. With this faith. We will be able to hew out of the mountain of despair a stone of hope. With this faith, we will be able to transform the jangling discords of our nation into a beautiful symphony of brotherhood. With this faith, we will be able to work together, to pray together, to struggle together, to go to jail together, to stand up for freedom together, knowing that we will be free one day. This will be the day, this will be the day with all of God's children be able to sing with new meaning my country tears of thee sweet land of liberty of thee i sing land where my fathers died land of the pilgrim's pride from every mountainside let freedom ring and if america is to be a great nation this must become true and so let freedom ring from the prodigious hilltops of new hampshire let freedom ring from the mighty mountains of New York. Let freedom ring from the heightening Alleghenies of Pennsylvania. Let freedom ring from the snow-capped Rockies of Colorado. Let freedom ring from the curvaceous slopes of California. But not only that, let freedom ring from Stone Mountain of Georgia. Let freedom ring from Lookout Mountain of Tennessee. Let freedom ring from every hill and mole hill of Mississippi, from every mountainside. Let freedom ring, and when this happens, and when we allow freedom ring, when we let it ring from every village and every hamlet, from every state, 
and every city. We will be able to speed up that day when all of God's children, black men and white men, Jews and Gentiles, Protestants and Catholics, will be able to join hands and sing in the words of the old Negro spiritual, free at last, free at last, thank God Almighty, we are free at last. Saying things like that, the movement was the, quote, greatest demonstration of freedom, end quote, in history. And that the country is still plagued by the, quote, manacles of segregation, end quote. And that one day, children will be, quote, judged not by the colour of their skin, but by the content of their character, end quote. Inspiring people across the country and making them excited that things may finally change. The march was not all good, as in response, the KKK bombed a black church, killing four black children. But nonetheless, he kept going. His campaign influenced the passing of the Civil Rights Act, banning discrimination in employment, voting and public facilities, highlighting his resilience in bad times, a good trait for a leader. The next year, he influenced the passage of the Voting Rights Act, allowing black people to vote without things like the Grandfather Clause, which initially stopped black people from voting. He was, however, assassinated in 1968 after a protest about housing discrimination. Even in death, he made change, as riots occurred in many cities in the country, leading to the Fair Housing Act, leaving a long-lasting legacy on the world. However, many do not see it this way, as they argue that he only focused on the South and not the North, and that other leaders such as Malcolm X and Joanne Robinson were more influential. But no matter what, you cannot deny the things he managed to achieve. Historians are always mixed about who or what event was the most significant in the civil rights movement. But here at the IBC, we argue that it does not matter who or what was the most significant as we think that they all played a part in a domino effect to achieve more or less equality. That brings us to the end of episode 1 of Summed Up History. We hope you all have all enjoyed it, and on behalf of everyone here at the IBC, we wish you all a very good day. Goodbye for now.